Okay, let's start. So, hi everyone. Welcome to the programming language virtual meetup, which is this meetup was created by Connor two years ago, a little bit more than two years ago. Is Connor here? Okay, Connor is not here, but yeah, this meetup is his basically. And I just decided to join and also kind of organize some meetings. So, so the, so, oh. Oh. oh, this is right. So, so we will this week we will start to cover this book called Crafting Interpreters, and we will go through the chapter one to three. Every time you have any questions, please interrupt me. Don't worry about time too much. If we take too long time to cover those three chapters, then I don't know, and then we can slow slow down our pace next time. Some other things is that we have a Discord that if you haven't joined, I will put it in the meeting chat. We have a code of conduct uh, and also we have a Twitter, but though I don't know how much time it will survive <laughs> now. So, so let's talk about the book. So this book, Crafting Interpreters, if you want to follow along, I'll put a link here. This book writes a little language called logs, and then it just gave us two implementations of this little language. By the way, can you see my whole browser, like all the tabs? Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Okay, good, good. So, So the chapter one is just start introduction, talking about uh, talking about uh, motivations and stuff, which I will not read. His writing is really beautiful, though. So if if you just want to come to the meetup and know what this book is about, I still highly recommend you read the book because his writing. Yeah, I was is impressed by how good his writing was. Yeah. I like. Yes. I recommend his other same, book. Same, same for me. I think it's very impressive. I recommended his other book to a friend, and she said, "Just she can't believe because I said that book's writing is beautiful, and she she initially didn't believe because I'm not a native speaker. But then she read this book, and then she just said, "Yeah, this writing is so good." Uh, there is a bit of humor in it and wordplay, but not too yeah. much. It's still a sort of on topic book, but uh, uh, really a delight to read. Yeah. Because I'm old, so, everything hurts. Yeah, so first he kind of talking to too much exercise, obviously. Sorry, what? Looks like we have a a, a meeting oh, bomber sorry. again. Uh, so first, it talk a little bit about that. The for the PL stuff, it's not as hard as it sounds. Stuff like that, and then it talk about why learning this stuff because. Uh, why every universities have 
a programming language course. And usually in those programming language course, we will teach a little bit of uh, theories, but also implement, it, implement a interpreter, which largely corresponding to the first half of this book. So if you notice, the, we have this tree work interpreter and then the second interpreter. So this is kind of what universities universities course usually cover is this interpreter. So why university need to teach this? Because, because uh, just uh, understand, I think understanding the semantics of the language have this kind of deep understanding is helpful when you learn new language. Also, also, this book delved even a little bit deeper. We start on can have some intuition about the inter implementations of language. Like, so for example, if you use Python, you probably want to know why why Python using certain patterns is slow and fast. Then you need to delve a little bit deeper and know little about how its interpreter work. This kind of stuff. Yeah, I, um, I had to take one of these university classes. And when I took it, we, we used Antler to, you know, generate the parser. And yeah. so that meant we had to implement it in Java. And, and the lot language we created was, it was sort of Python-like, but, but not, not really Python. And, it, it, it was fun, but also challenging, you know, the, the a lot of my, I remember my interpreter had lots of bugs in it that, um, you know, I had to fix and figure out. Yeah, that's a fun part. This kind of things is like, we, the only way to root off bugs is to, I think is to write a lot of tests basically. And even that you cannot guarantee you don't have bugs. Uh, interestingly, I heard that uh, fewer and fewer students study compilers because universities had to make space for more fashionable topics like uh, data science, uh, machine learning, and so on. So some of the universities ended up cutting the compilers course for from the curriculum. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. Also, we, we are not talking about comp compiler course. Usually this kind of programming, programming language course that teaching interpreters uh, before the compiler course at least in my experience. We will definitely not delve in super deep into compiler stuff because this this book is this book is like so for we are making a language like Python, so we kind of have a compiler front end that and for the second part, at least, we will have a compiler front end that try to compile Python, no, have compile our language into a kind of bytecode. And then we just you create a virtual machine to execute that bytecode. We don't have the other part of the compiler. And also for the compiler front end, for a lot of languages, the semantic analysis is a hard part because we just have a really dynamic language. So almost no semantic analysis. So that's also different. Also, also it's a useful skill to know how to create little languages. It's Especially people who just use using stuff like JSON a lot, where sometimes it's it's probably more beneficial to have some kind of DSL. So there are a lot of those kind of DSLs. 
with CPP. <laughs> That's weird. So I think for I that, guess, I mean, yeah, I guess the CPU processor is something. Yeah, I think you might be talking about the processor. That's... Yeah, I guess it is a DSL. It's just like, I guess uh, in it, theory, you can just, use yeah. it in any text yeah. file, basically. Yeah, it's, it's just a bad one. It's just a bad DSL. <laughs> it's it's not as fun as M4 as far as these sort of text substitution macro languages go. Yeah. P because in, yeah, in, in, in theory you can use you can use the preprocessor in any. So oh, sorry, someone has echo. Uh yeah. So sometimes we need, we need to roll our own, or maybe roll our own is a better option than using existing stuff. I actually stumble upon the time and this kind of things a few times. I I like to write DSL like uh, S expression like DSL because it's very simple to parse. But also just as kind of data with some additional logic kind of things, which is hard to express in JSON, for example. Uh, just one point. If um, I did hear a bit of a microphone uh, conflict, and um, if, if you're having trouble uh, having your say, uh, you can put your, um, do the put the hand up and we can look out for each other. Yeah, also, and also it's just a good personal project. So if if you want to do some personal projects, I guess there are two kinds of people who want to do personal projects. One was when I was in a certain stage, I just want to do a project. I have no, no idea what I want to do. This was me before, and now I'm at the stage where I have so much ideas, but I don't have any time to do any of them. But, but if you are one of those people who have no idea what you can do, then doing a little interpreter is a really good exercise. So uh, what should be th the first thing we write when we're writing an interpreter is we write like a hash map with all the, uh, a set of a set of key value pairs where we have like our tokens. Is that correct? Is that what we should uh, we specify our all our tokens? Yeah, not necessarily in a hash map, but yes, we need to write a tokenizer in some way. That's the first thing we do, right? Yeah, yeah, you can write a parser without a uh, lexer, uh, just like parse the strings, but that's sometimes it's harder. So usually a lot of implementation will like talk about Does that, start, first does that, that start in chapter two? No, it starts chapter in chapter four. Chapter four. Oh, yeah, ch chapter four, part two. So yeah, the first three chapters are just kind of, uh, they're just kind of introduction. Uh, I mean, I, I'm the, I don't know, I don't know what you guys think, but like, whenever I read a book, I get annoyed by long introductions, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, well, but uh, this, I, I quite like this introduction, particular um, chapter two, a map of the territory, I think really makes, uh, gives God a good overview what interpreters and compilers do. This um, yeah. main picture with the mountain is great i think it's yeah really i love that I, I like that picture That's yeah awesome. i agree with the picture thing yeah i like the the map that shows yeah, you that, you know exactly, exactly, yeah. scanning tokens parsing syntax tree you go up the mountain yeah yeah uh, so, so um, basically our first interpreter just stop at here i was yes. yeah our second one goes to here uh, but we, yeah, we don't have any optimizations also. And we don't have any IR either. We actually, we actually, the signal is a little bit weird because we kind of, from parsing, we don't even, don't even generate AST, we directly go to here. 
AST? Yeah. Where's because AST? the language is so simple. He, he so we do have the syntax tree. That's the syntax tree. Yeah. Oh, so, sorry. Yeah, I, I should not use acronyms. Oh, yeah. abstract syntax tree. Yeah, oh, makes AST sense. means abstract syntax tree. I know what that means. I know what abstract syntax tree means, but it's been, it's actually more, more a recent term for me than, than, uh, yeah. He, he does, he does, he, I, I think he does generate an AST. I mean, the whole. For the second part, he doesn't. For the first In the part, second part. Does. In the first yeah. part, he does with the tree walk. Yeah. No spoilers. So <laughs> if he's if he's going to machine code, then he's not only crafting an interpreter; he's crafting a compiler. Is that correct? Because well, that uh, like the... Yeah, we will talk about this later. But you can see the second interpreter is also a compiler. This is Just actually like, what I really liked about the second chapter because it yeah. it helps clear this up. I hadn't thought about it this way before because he talks about, I think near the end, about like, so wait, is it a compiler or it's or is it an interpreter? And he says, well, it's an interpreter that uses a compiler as part of it, right? So a yeah, lot of it's we think exactly of this. Yeah. So a lot of things that we think of as being interpreted, like so his definition of interpreter is just that you give it code and then it runs the code. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And everything exactly. else is implementation detail. So there may be compilers in there, JIT, Spike, whatever, but it's an interpreter because you give it the code and then it runs it immediately, as opposed to like Clang, where you give it code and then it gives you something else that doesn't just run it. And that means it's a compiler that actually has interpreters and compilers inside of it. Right. Speaking of like the C preprocessor, right? So there's interpreters inside the compiler, but it's also just a compiler. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, interpreter of so, small um, DSL. Yeah. If I if I open up, let's say, an IPython interpreter on my computer now, and I type in one plus one and hit enter, does that still compile to bytecode? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. So okay, that's interesting. Yeah, even Python, even Python's implementation actually do some compilation. Yeah. Otherwise, it's too slow to be useful, basically. Yeah, and well, so different wanted... implementations do different types of compiling. Like PyPy is known for being more aggressive about its compilation. Yeah, it's, it's, it yeah, PyPy actually does JET. So that means it, usually when people are talking about JETs, it's just in time compiled to machine code. Why, why do people talk about PyPy? Like, does anybody use PyPy? No, oh, yeah. I, I don't use <laughs> it. It's just I, like, I, yeah. I've, uh, I've used it. I've used it for some projects where Python was useful for. They weren't long lived, and it was. We need a little bit more speed. Um, usually, you can get a lot of what you need out of NumPy, but if something has, um, for some characteristics, PyPy is very nice. You know, everything's PyPy got sort of useful. issues. Go ahead. PyPy is quite useful for. Uh... For some of the problems on advent of code, when uh, they take a little bit too long to run in uh, regular Python. Um, okay. Nice. Yeah, uh, from from my understanding, PyPy works very well when you have really pure Python code and you don't call into um, libraries which on underlying have a lot of C code, so like NumPy and stuff. If you don't do that, then PyPy really can speed up things. I think that's, that's even. Are, are we right. cons are we also considering like three point eleven, which had a lot of speed improvements? I haven't 3. used 11, it. Yeah, three point eleven uh, might obviate some of the pipe I need, but it's you know it's still pretty brand new. So fair enough. I haven't been able to even to get it fully working on my on my Linux yet, for my own path dependent reasons, my own, my own hell of Python libraries. So I wanted to comment, I think it makes a lot of sense that for this sort of book on domain specific language implementation, uh, he does cover implementing a JIT uh, because it can come up more often than you would think that you have a very specialized uh, type of programming language, like something for HTML templating, for example, and you want as much throughput as possible. So even though your first implementation is a basic uh, interpreter, uh, you inevitably end up wanting to jit it. So uh, I think it makes a lot of sense. 
It depends on, I, I think it depends on what kind of thing this language do though. If this language is really high level, like just really descriptive kind of language that says that's like one line equal to thousand line of actual code, then why bother making it fast? Yeah, because yeah, most of the time it, that stuff doesn't isn't like very like hot code, right? It's like part of a build step or well, something. Well, yeah, I mean that's why I use the example of HTML templating because that's yeah. extremely hot code. Like you want yeah, to yeah, serve yeah. as many web yeah. pages as quickly as possible from your uh, with as little computing power as possible. So you inevitably want to get rid of interpretation for that. Uh, I think the other major approach besides jitting to machine code that you could use is you could use code generation. Uh, so you can do something like uh, generate a C program and then feed that to a compiler and then you get machine code and you can run that. Uh, so yeah. for some domain specific languages that can make a lot of sense. Yeah, he talks about that in this chapter too. That's yeah, enough. I think this, this chapter or the next chapter, he talks about transpiling to C, which is a popular approach. Is that cheating? Not really. It pays it's, my it's, salary, so. He's buying a bag salad cheating. Yeah, it's it's I think it's become harder later because the well, transpiler it's really hard to have the same kind of experience as a compiler and also additional problem is like for C you know to hundred percent sure the C code you generate is good. I mean I work on system tap, which is a one hundred thousand line of code project that's essentially a transpiler so you can go pretty far with that as well yeah so. uh, one advantage of transpiling to c you piggyback on a lot of the optimizations that c compilers can do on the other hand um, i did see projects where they ended up uh, ditching the transpilation to C and implementing an LLVM backend or something directly. And they actually got a speed up because there are certain invariants uh, that they can express in LLVM IR, but they cannot express in C. Yeah, to the LLVMs are really good. So, so the, yeah, so the major disadvantage of that, I think though, uh, is that C is a stable interface more or less, but LLVM bitcode is not. Uh, so I think if you go on a Linux distribution like Fedora uh, and search for which LLVM packages are available, you'll see they have packages for LLVM 5, LLVM 6, LLVM 7, and so on through the latest LLVM uh, because they have all kinds of different uh, domain specific languages that were implemented at one point on top of LLVM. And then it wasn't worth the effort of porting them to each new version of LLVM. Uh, so they're stuck shipping all of those old versions. So. Also, C is not very expressive. Like you have two pointers, you don't know whether they are aliasing or not, stuff like that. So all kind of impact optimization potentials. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, I guess the last thing the book, the chapter one talk about is that it is just fun. I guess I agree because the they also yeah where's Connor to transfer us to HR? <laughs> yeah, if you don't know Connor, so Connor is the organizer of this meetup. He is a huge APL fan. So if he's here, he will talk about APL. <laughs> and it's like the bat signal. You just say APL and he appears. <laughs> yeah, so so basically basically this this kind of thing is fun. We're, we just see a language, we kind of see actually how it works, and we just hack them together. Yeah. 
Transforming APL that... to OBMP. Oh, there's a there's actually an interesting. It's not APL though. Its syntax is totally ML syntax, but it is kind of an array language. We put it here. One thing that surprised me, and maybe I'm wrong about this, but it, it doesn't seem like the author talks about, you know, compiler compilers, you know, tools like Lex and Yak, where you take like a, you know, like a BNF grammar and and then it generates a bunch of stubs yeah. that then you Yeah, you he, plug he into. talked about he will yeah. not use them. That's it. Yeah, he, he talked about them long enough to say that we're not going to use them. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I mean, that's not code that's very hard to write by hand. Um, it's, it's just, yeah. The point, the point he, I'm trying to find the page he says it on, but he basically says, those are great, but he wants to roll our own. So we understand it. It's just the level of chopping he wants to go to. He doesn't want to get it, it pre-cut. He wants to slice and dice it in front of us. Yeah. Well, was, Interestingly, if you look at sort of real world major compilers like G LLVM or GCC, and you look at the parser, they're not going to be using Yak either. So it's all yeah. going to be hand coded. So those things I think is useful for rapid prototyping. Like if you want to change the syntax a lot, but we are not doing that. So it's fine to not use it. Fair enough. Um, I'm ready to yeah. go down the rabbit hole. So how the book is organized. Yeah, so they talked about the book have company code in the in this repository. You put it in the chat. with basically two implementations, the Java implementation and C implementations that you can actually run. And it can actually have a test suite. So you can, if you want to write your own logs interpreter, you can use his text suite basically. And yeah. Also, he talks about lexers and parser generators. I don't like the term compiler compilers because at the end of the day, the majority of work of compilers are not parsers, right? So it's interesting. I think that term made a bit more sense in like however many decades ago it was that people more commonly yeah. wrote one pass compilers. Uh, yeah. And so in that, case you would literally be generating code uh yeah, generating in whatever code from action. yeah so actually the second part of the second part of the uh, book does exactly that it generates bytecode directly from parsing yeah it's it's interesting though that this kind of design trend tends to go seems to have gone back and forth over history because before you had one pass compilers uh, on really old machines where you have only like a kilobyte or a couple of kilobytes of RAM, uh, people would instead be writing very, very uh, many pass compilers uh, just because of uh, the need to uh, use very limited memory uh, and sort of save intermediate data structures to disk in the process. So you might have like a 20 pass ancient compiler that fits into tiny RAM. So I can, I, I'm not from back from when there was just a couple of K, but I'm back from when there was 64 K or eight K and on the original IBM PC, the, the basic compiler from 
Microsoft was uh, two or three pass, and it cost like five hundred dollars. And what's fascinating to me about this book is it brings back memories of Turbo Pascal, which came out in I guess the late eighties, cost seventy five dollars, and was just so fast. And it's the techniques that are in here, and it's fascinating to see them uh, exposed so clearly. Just a small fun fact regarding parser generators. So Microsoft's C++ compiler, MSVC, is still using Yak to this day, but they are trying to get rid of it because uh, yeah, they, they have some trouble making like high quality warning message or error messages rather. Um, really? That's what part of the compiler do they use it in? Like, I also wonder how it affects compilation times. That was, that was actually the first thing I thought of, of like, why not to use uh, something like Yak? Because if it's something very optimized, you can make it faster. So, so in Clang, they are experimenting with a fuzzy parser that's supposed to be faster than the actual parsing with all the semantic actions. And uh, that is also based on a parser generator. Interesting, MSVC is still using YAC. I guess that's also say about how powerful this kind of thing is because C++, right? Yeah, well, I, mean, I also wonder what stage of the, uh, the compiler it's used in. Sorry, pardon? You mean what stage? Yeah, like is the entire, like is the whole uh, like syntax tree? I don't think that's entirely Yak, right? I don't know. I, <laughs> I would those kind of information like are probably part. confidential. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so sorry, uh, what was the question about the syntax tree and Yak? Uh, what part of the compilation pipeline is Yak used in MSVC? Yeah, parsing. So parsing is is uh, based on Yak, and and of course uh, C grammar is ambiguous, so they have a lot of hacks in place to make sure that uh, they can disambiguate using the types and so on. Got it. Cool. So yeah. how does this book, like some, someone mentioned like Turbo Pascal and how this book um, gave them flashbacks of Turbo Pascal. Um, like wasn't Turbo Pascal compiled? Like didn't, didn't it compile down to native code or was it, it, was did. it byte code? Oh, okay. It, compi it compiled to native code and it, it just was so much faster than anything else at the time. It was fast and uh, unbelievably cheap. Uh, when we were used to only either having uh, interpreted basic, which was incredibly slow, or very expensive compilers, or you got a disk from somebody with some version of C on it that maybe worked. It was it, it was a dark time. So when okay. you say it was fast, do you mean do you mean fast compilation or fast run? Fast compilation, and and oh. and it performed fast because it was compiled compared to. Uh, the native basic on the machines that was interpreted. Right. So it was much faster to operate and it was incredibly fast to compile for the day. Okay, so the, the te techniques in this book can contributed to that fast compilation. Is, is yeah. that what you, I see? Yeah, yeah, the guy who wrote it, uh, and I, I've forgotten his name, uh, but the guy who wrote it I've read interviews with him and, and the techniques he talked about are what 
are being a lot of them are being explained here. This book goes a lot further because it covers decades since then. Uh, it gets into object oriented and things that didn't exist, at least not commonplace. But um, much of the techniques that allowed Turbo Pascal to run so fast on a machine with 256K of RAM and uh, a 16 bit processor are here. I mean, some people had access to mini computers where you had much faster and better systems. But if you had a PC back in the early 90s, well, late 80s, yeah, you, you didn't have a lot of choices. Yeah. And Nicholas Worth, the guy who you know, came up with Pascal, his own system, the, the Berkeley P system stuff, which he talks about in the book here, uh, which was an intermediate bytecode language, that was really slow. That took forever to compile. And did not run fast. So I and believe the main the main resources. The main rationale for that was to reduce effort to port it to lots of different architectures. And to allow multiple languages. The idea was you'd have compilers for different languages produce P code. But just the idea ahead of, ahead of its time. Was Modula 2 one of those other languages or, or I... Yeah, because that was his language. Yeah. I see. Modula 2. But also basic. They had a basic P system thing. And I think there was a Fortran. But it's, it's similar concepts, but a sort of 10,000, 30,000 foot level to LLVM or WebAssembly. I wonder how much of those, the, the same stuff, like, you know, like the Go compiler, right? That's supposed to be optimized for compilation time. I, I wonder how much of this, this, these sort of techniques are, are used there. It, it always seemed weird to me to, to pri prioritize, you know, in this day and age that you would prioritize compilation time over execution time, but hey, you know, developer time is expensive, so. I mean, if you've ever worked on large C++ projects, it's, uh... Yeah, 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 totally. Yeah, no, large CPAPAS, large Rust, large Scala, all have those kind of problems and it's not nice, basically. Uh, yeah, the books talk about snippet, which which the idea is you can just copy and paste snippet and then your code can always be running. So that's a really good thing about this book. It's, it will not leave you in some half broken states that you need to fix in several chapters later. And then just a bunch of other stuff in Including design note, which is I, I think I think one of the nicer part of this book is so there is those design note, which is kind of like he's thinking about programming language designs, the trade-offs. I don't see a whole lot of like REPL examples in, in the book. Is, is, is that like part of this interpreter or, or, or it, it, it's uh, not that now? If how, I remember that, not... correctly, it is not. But okay. I, I think it's pretty trivial to add a REPL to this scene. It, it, has, it has a REPL, although- It has a REPL, after, okay. It, has a, it starts with REPL. Although after a few chapters, it's not the easiest to interact with, but it has a REPL. And in some of the questions, some of the um, one of the one of the chapters has a has a homework assignment to 
it, to make the REPL keep working even after you've made some changes that make it less effective. Yeah, so. And I'm looking forward to someone else answering it and showing me how it works because I didn't figure it out. <laughs> Okay, yeah, well, we, when we go through there, we will talk about it. Usually, REPL for, for certain languages, you need slightly different syntax. Like, the, the worst example is OCaml's like double semicolon. <laughs> I forgot what that did, but I, it was, it must have been something bad. No, it, it just means, hey, repo, I, I am stopped typing. So interpret whatever is before. Otherwise, God. you can just keep typing. It will just give, a new, give you a new line. Let's see. What makes a repo good? History auto complete, auto complete. Yeah, I think those are both important. For history, it's pretty easy to have a library, though. For auto complete, that's a bigger thing. Yeah, it was mostly a reaction to Sergei's comment. I was wondering uh, which part uh, is the hard part. I think like all of all of those examples you mentioned are good, but I think the main uh, one is sort of fitting it into the flow of problem solving with the language. Uh, so you have to think backwards from what kinds of problems the language is going to help you with that you would need a REPL for, and then that tells you what the features have to be. Oh, so so you mean actually designing the language? in a way that the repo feels natural. Mm, yeah, I mean, it can even get into that, especially in this type of thing, where if you're doing a domain specific language, then you obviously have the leeway to uh, make it more or less suitable for that type of thing. Yeah, for, for DSL, it's a repo, it's, it's a little bit unusual, so. It depends on the DSL. Yeah, it depends. Well, yeah, then the book talk about the interpreters. The first interpreters is in Java. It basically focuses on semantics of the language. We, we don't talk about any formal semantics, though. It's we have we have some we have the other week's meeting that we are reading that book. Uh, this book is about formal semantics. Not in this book. We so don't worry. If we don't have we don't we have any math symbols in this book, and but the idea is we will just talk talk about uh, how the code will behave, and performance is not important at least for this implementation. And that's why we will do our tree working interpreter. It's actually not the worst, worst kind of thing we can do for an interpreter though. We can actually write a interpreter slower than this kind of evaluating trees. We, we can write an interpreter like step through trees, like when, perform one step at a time or, or even doing substitution based interpreter that would be even slower but I think this kind of interpreter is super common for university class to teach because universities uh, programming language course is also usually for the semantics not really care about the runtime but the sec the second interpreter is 
Actually, we will write it in a low level language and do everything from scratch. We also, the performance will be pretty good, even compared to production uh, language in the same kind of categories like Python, for example. So as before, someone mentioned that the, that probably the good idea is not using Java and not using C where you implement those interpreters, which I agree. It is probably a good idea to not copy and paste the book, but instead, uh, instead doing something different. For the first part, you need a garbage collector though. Otherwise you basically, you need to do a bunch of the second part job in your first part. So any garbage collected language, I think will be suffice. If the language either support inheritance or some type, I think it's better. So I don't know. I, I don't think Golang support those, but there are a bunch of Golang interpreters I don't know if they implement the first one or second one though. Yeah, the second interpreter using C, so we can also use in uh, C alternative, C++, Rust, or like Dig, like someone mentioned in the comments, those languages is a good choice. The second uh, interpreter, I, I, sorry, what? I'm planning to um, implement the um, interpreter in NIM. I've, I've seen there are already implementations in that. <laughs> um, yeah, but so I think this is a sort of good match because it's procedural like Java and it has a garbage collector. So I think the first interpreter I can uh, yeah, do with that, that should work. Yeah, nice. It looks very much like Python. That's why I got there. Um, so yeah, yeah but it's a, it's a syntax wise. Okay. Yeah, some challenges. We probably need to speed up a little bit, so. There are a bunch of challenges about like, just if you are, because the book is written in Java and say, you need some familiarity with those languages. It's fine you if you don't know Java. Uh, if you use any, Oh, Pete, like language with features like class and inheritance, those kind of stuff, then you can probably understand what he's doing with Java. But say you're only coming from a C background or like a functional language background, then probably you need to read a little bit about certain things. Is is anybody gonna try to write the first interpreter in, in C or does that seem that's, in, inappropriate? Yeah, that seems a weird choice. It's almost okay, but C doesn't have a garbage collector. Right, right. Yeah, no, no. And and why do yeah, we need so a garbage collector? Like because the, lab, the language itself, the language we are implemented is garbage collected. I see. Okay. So you can use reference counting. C++ has this thing called field pointer. You can use that, but then you will have a problem of uh, like shared pointer. 
uh, will have a destructor that if you do reference counting, it will <clears throat> and have a long chain like say a linked list or something, it will just stack overflow. I have this experience before. So don't you see Papas or Rust if you don't want to uh, implement a garbage collector yourself for the first part. Got it. Okay. Good, good, good advice. Yeah, Let's for the second it. part, yeah, totally go for it. But Leslie, would you say it maybe goes wrong with garbage collection when you start to have the environments where you've got to keep track of and, and they and they have to get uh, removed as you move up and down the stack? Is that is that where it kind of goes gets really hard to do without a garbage collector? Or maybe even earlier? Yeah. Yeah, for the environment, for the environment, I think it's still okay because if you just have a scope based environment like CIPA pass, you can just like say scope to exit, you just drop the whole stuff. But once you have like heap allocation, dynamically allocated stuff, like in most programming garbage collector languages, you can allocate arbitrary sized objects where in non-garbage collected languages, every type will have explicit size. That's why you know how to reserve this size on the stack. Right, so it goes wrong earlier. Makes sense. I would think counting the garbage... is fast and reliable. Garbage collection has no virtues. Uh, sorry, I disagree a lot with this statement. Also, also, uh, yeah. So I, I think this is up to debate, but at least for me, reference counting is a garbage collecting method. It's not saying it's a separate thing. I think if you're using garbage collection, you're supporting an ill-designed language. Um, languages that force you to allocate things and manually, explicitly, and don't evaporate them when there's no more references to them without you having to do anything, are not languages that are designed for the computer between our ears. Yeah, yeah, it's not language. That's why we, we have those languages that don't do that. But at the end of days, some people just want the productivity. They don't care if their, their code runs tag slower, if it is on the code path. And the hot path, they can just call into some C++ code, whatever. So. Some, some people are lazy. You know, they don't want to think about object lifetimes or any of that. Yeah, not, like not a... necessarily lazy. Like, for example, do you want to see, you want to, even you are C programmers, see, like, do you want to write a make file where you need to explicitly allocate memory? Then you're, then you're, you're, you're doomed. Yeah. <laughs> so start like a Instagram, right? So they, they run all this Python code on, on, on the back end and they, uh, they turned off garbage collection because of performance. <laughs> they were just like, we're, we're just gonna turn it off and, and, and leak memory and, and it'll, it'll perform and it performs better that way. So, you know, it's just, it's, you know, it's a, it's a trade-off. It's like, do you want to? Yeah. Some compilers not, actually, like simple compilers, I have seen compiler tutorials, simple compiler tutorials just use malloc forever and never free. And it's okay because it's short-lived program. And or not, not, every, not every little script is as big as uh, the whole system. So for a little script, which you just uh, cobble together, it might be fine to have a garbage collector. Yeah, it's it very depends. convenient. So, if you look yeah. at the, look at look at the SAC language, this uh, SAC is a functional array language that has uh, a similar spirit to that of APL. 
it's, it's functional. It is purely call by value, but it supports arrays of arbitrary rank and shape. Uh, can you put a link? And there is no concept of malloc. You know, you create an array, you do something with it, and when it's no longer needed, it evaporates because the reference count goes to zero. You're done. Oh, we are talking about this language. Um, we are talking about this. Languages. That is an outgrowth of languages, uh, APL derived languages, and if you look at SAC, you'll see, you can see where uh, where this crowd got their some of their ideas from. Yes, yeah, so can you put a link because I don't know the language that you are talking about. This is the Copenhagen crowd, right? Okay, I guess for the the last part of the last part of the chapter, just talking about you need to give your language a name, which which is so hard that GitHub even give a project name generator for us. <laughs> Sack a functional array language for, yeah, it's for this kind of stuff for parallel. And it's the same kind of thing for these languages that you have parallel execution basically. Yeah, um, I believe I'm not sure, but I believe that Futark may be, uh, what's the word for it? Um, there's one of these academic words where you have to have everything defined perfectly or it won't run. Um, SAC is not like that. SAC will just go, go, and when something goes wrong, it'll stop. Yeah, for, for GPU though, for GPU though, it's well, probably you're talking about type safe. Yeah, for GPU though, it's like, because it's a lot harder to do like runtime tracking on GPU. Than on CPU, so it you probably not, don't want. Yeah, you not. probably want to do this kind of stuff on at compile it'll, time. It'll run faster if if you get if you can eliminate those things statically, and there's certainly mm -hmm. a lot of work going on in in SAC and with in Apex, which is uh, my compiler, to get rid of these uh, runtime checks statically by algebraic and and polyhedral analysis. Yeah, cool stuff, cool stuff. It's, uh, it's not necessary. Yeah. It just runs it's slower. 45 pages though. <laughs> yeah, I will give it a read. <laughs> I think at least it's a bit long. <laughs> okay, so then the second chapter of the book, well, we finish the first chapter introduction for the second chapter of the book. We are talking about what we mean by a language inter, uh, implementation. So first thing is that a programming language and language implementation is a, is different. For example, people like to talk about compiled language, interpreted language, but that actually doesn't make sense because you can. You can totally write a C interpreter that runs slower than Python and follows the C spec. The C spec does not mandate anything about the performance. So 
that's so that's different. And this book, this book though, because it's talking about language implementation, it will just say language unless it's not it's ambiguous. It will say implementation. And then the book starts to talk about this graph, which is different kind of implementations we can get from the source code. We usually have tokenizer to generate a bunch of tokens. And then we parse to generate some kind of syntax tree. You can go directly from here to syntax tree. So usually, usually it's easier to have a separate step and then the first, our first interpreter just stopped here. And a lot of interpreters stopped at here. But if, if our language is a little bit more complicated, then we need to do some semantic analysis, like type checking, name binding, name binding, this kind of thing is also, for example, REST, uh, uh, borrow checker, those kind of stuff. We need to do it at this stage. And then we have some IR, intermediate representation. So this is like LVM IR kind of, usually, usually those representation are generic enough to represent a bunch of different languages as we talked about before, like Pascal's P code was one of the earliest. And, and then like, people did a lot of work on how to optimize program. And we find that certain kind of IR is easier to optimize than others, like uh, static single assignments, this kind of stuff. So that's Another reason to have an IR is like we need some easier to optimize format so we can do some a lot of optimization. Static single assignment has nothing to do with your intermediate representation, um, because you can have you can have any intermediate representation, and whether it uses static single assignment or not doesn't matter. It yeah. what static single assignment does do is dramatically simplify um, a lot of the optimization work that you might want to do. I mean, you can do things like saying, oh, here's a value error. This, this array wasn't, this thing was never, name was never assigned a value. You can find that out statically with static single assignment. You can, uh, you can do magic. It, it makes 90% of the compiler optimization and uh, related headaches just evaporate. It's wonderful stuff. I highly recommend it. Yeah, and then another purpose of and, IR and, is yeah. then we can generate so, arbitrary so, code. Sorry, ju sorry, just a quick question about single assignment. Is that uh, a single assignment form, static single assignment form? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I didn't know the term, so I just looked it up on. Yeah. It was, uh, okay. It was a. Uh, it, it comes from uh, Watson people at Watson. Uh, IBM Research, and it's 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 one of those things where you're doing. How do I do this? You know, and then along comes static single assignment. It's like. Okay, not only do I not have to worry about how to do this fast or precisely, I don't have to do it at all because it just, the, the problem evaporates. And it's, it's the same as having languages that, that handle um, the, the, through reference counting, uh, get rid of the need to, to do garbage click. The, it makes things faster simpler and if you're playing you bet your company you'll like you'll like what you can do with them okay
Yeah, so modern compilers are usually a little bit com more complex than this kind of very staged picture, especially for language like C++, which gets a lot messier, but the, the kind of ideal, at least for the, these kind of toy languages, we can have, yeah, it's okay. See you next time. Uh, the kind of ideal for our toy languages, we have different stages where we do, we do this tokenizing, uh, also called scanning or lexing or lexical analysis, all mean the same thing. Where we give a bunch of uh, text characters and then we generate tokens. Ken Iverson calls that word formation. And if you look at the right hand side of roughly where your cursor is now, it says lexical comes from the word Greek, Greek root lex, meaning word. And word formation is one of those things that you could explain to a fourth grader and they would understand what you meant. If you say lexical analysis or lexing or scanning, your audience is gonna be running away. Yeah, yeah. So simple, there's always a simple word that describes what you want to do that, that is, not, is not created by uh, postdocs for the sole purpose of scaring away people. Yeah, so it's kind of like this, those kind of terms doesn't get popular when reason is like words are like very overloaded term. We are talking uh, much less ambiguous um, what it means. I absolutely disagree. And so then we can we can do parsing. That's kind of how our syntax get a grammar. If you learn a little bit like like theory of computation stuff, then probably you know about like grammar, context-free grammar, this kind of stuff. But usually we don't really need to care about that much. It's just like we have a parser, we have a bunch of tokens and then we generate some tree structure from it. And that's called the abstract syntax tree. And the beautiful thing about this kind of tree is it can represent almost all the languages. For example, like, like this one. This one is add variables and then divide by two. And then is there assignment, but just the idea is like that. And then the book, then we need to uh, do static analysis which the book actually doesn't talk about because we have a very simple dynamic type language. We, we don't need to do anything at static analysis basically, but uh, well, I guess we still need to do a little bit of name resolution where like, we have a symbol like A and B, where does it come from? What's its scope? So we need to find it. And then if our language is statically typed, then we also need to do type checking at this stage. But we, we don't need to focus those too much because this, this is not the focus of this book. Otherwise this, the type checking stuff, type system, you'll be, 
much more important. Then for the next stage, after after here, we finally have a code gen for general intermediate representation, which this book will also not do. So, but and but we talk a little bit about what IR is. It's usually used in the compilers to have multiple purpose for optimization, but also can support different source language and different targets. Yeah, the SAC compiler that I was talking about earlier um, does that. It has a different form of abstract syntax tree from the Apex compiler, uh, but it does have the ability to, uh, because the abstract syntax tree is uh, is abstract, <laughs> it, it has the ability to describe um, array programs, parallel array programs, in a way that is deadly portable. Like if you want to, you want to say, oh, I want this to run serial, or I want it to run on a multi-threaded uh, P-threads machine, or I want it to run on a GPU. All you do is you change the target uh, in the compiler and you, your source code remains utterly, completely unchanged. And so uh, what that means is that porting to uh, a new host or a new, a new target system uh, reduces substantially the chances of, of, of code faults and uh, you bet your company losing because what the changes you made have target system assumptions embedded in the algorithm itself where they really do not belong. They belong only in generated code. Yeah, and then we have optimization, which we can do it on syntax tree, but people kind of found out it's much easier to do it on a linear representation, a linear IR. So we usually do it on IR now. And there are a lot of stuff can be do on compile time optimization, but it's also not the focus of this book. So we will skip that and the final the final step is the code generation. We just, we have some intermediate representation or even syntax tree, and then we just need to generate some code. And it's either machine code or sometimes it's byte code. And the, the byte codes are usually wrong or jitted on a virtual machine. And they're never a byte long. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then the book actually so I'll talk about virtual machine because the, our languages will have a pretty heavy runtime for, for those kinds of languages. It needs to perform garbage collection. It needs to actually run those bytecode. So all those stuff will be in this virtual machine, which is also a program we need to write. That's why in the most programming languages, when we run them, we need another program to run them. We can't just run them by itself. Yeah, the other, the other thing is the runtime, which uh, always, you are writing some really bare metal stuff. Even, 
different languages like C, you usually need to have some runtime for this uh, for certain things to function properly to call the OS stuff like that. But if the language like say many mem memories, then we need a garbage collector. So the garbage collector can be in a virtual machine, but also it can be in a language like Go, for example, it's just ship it in the binary. Then I talked a little bit about the shortcut. Single, pa single pass compilers is, sorry. Someone said something? Oh, it's just echo. Uh, I think it's fine for now. Yeah, single pass compilers are just the second, the second part of the book, the we will actually implement a single pass compiler where we go directly from parsing into code generation with no syntax tree, no IR in the middle. Tree, tree work, tree work interpreters is usually those small project in university students do. It's also very slow, not useful for production purpose, basically. And, uh, but this will be our first interpreter because we don't care about speed for now. It's also a tree working interpreter because how easy it is to implement. It is really good for prototyping. Then the last is transpiler. Transpiler also have, I think a lot of uses. For example, especially before LLVM come around, if we need to write a language, we want it to we want it to run pretty fast and don't have much dependencies and want it to be portable, then a good choice is to write a C transpiler because then we can just use all the C compiler infrastructures. And of course, GS, GS transpiler is very popular. For example, language like uh, TypeScript or Elm. All, all those languages transpile into transpile into JavaScript because that's basically how code gets run on the browser. Uh, before Watson come around at least. But even with Wasm, we still need JavaScript. And as long as JavaScript exists as the main kind of portable assembly for the web, we will need JavaScript transpilers for all those web languages. And at the end is the JIT. Uh, to be honest, I, I don't have much expertise at all. Well, not expertise, I should say. It's much knowledge at all at JIT. So, except it's pretty complicated. So are, are the interpreters uh, that we're writing for this book, you know, it looks like, you know, static type check checking, we're just gonna skip over that. Uh, yeah. That, so, so like, what about, you know, like, you know the, the 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 typical errors. You know, like like uh, un, like an undefined variable that that's just gonna that's just gonna blow up at runtime. Like if if we're you know we call yeah. a function. Yeah, it, 
think about how you write a language in like Python or JavaScript. It's the exactly the same kind of experience. We, we don't have a separate stage for uh, type checking or like this kind of stuff, basically. Yeah, so it'll be the same sort of experience, runtime experience where, 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 you know, some very, you know, some very obvious errors ha happen at, at, at runtime because of mm. how the, how it's evaluated. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm just getting flashbacks to when I, when I had to do this in 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 university, and and uh, it's you, you you know the like the, the because the you know I didn't write these the the code very well you know I would just and my thing was written in Java like when when I ran into problems like that most of the time I would get you know a a, a, a Java exception would get thrown and 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 that would be, that would be you know that that would be my error message <laughs> yeah yeah I, I can understand because I did the same kind of things it's okay for like small interpreters to do quick hacks like that With the line number. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. At, at least if you throw an exception through a like host language exception, give something, some context, line number is like minimum. <laughs> right. <laughs> And then I think this is a really good part of this book, which talks about compilers and interpreters, which people like to treat it as a separate thing. Oh, this language is compiled, it's fast. Uh, this language is interpreted, it's slow, which actually is not that clear. Where in reality, in reality, the compiler and Oh, sorry, I, I think I my Zoom crashed again. <clears throat> How much did we lost? Have we talked? Uh, I think we are talking about this part. So yeah, the. Yeah, I, don't, I didn't miss much, I don't think, so. Yeah, okay. So yeah, basically the books especially distinguish like compiler is an implementation technique with compilation. The interpreter is a user experience. Yeah, we just type some code and it can run. So that's that's why we can have some program that's both compiler and the interpreter and some other program can be neither we can see most modern programming languages actually fall into kind of in the middle category nowadays
go go tools like you can use go build or go wrong. As a lot of languages are also also like that. Even for JavaScript, there are a lot of like JavaScript compiler that compile. I guess it's transpiler of transpiler like ex6 into es5 stuff like that. And then you can also then run it. Uh, so most most programming languages belong to in the middle category because let's say Haskell is compiled, but also, also it has a repo where you can just type stuff and it runs. So the idea is the same as fruit and vegetable is that com compilation and the interpretation are not mutually exclusive. Oh, yeah, fine. We are a little bit late though. So maybe next time we will cover a little bit less. And then for chapter three, chapter three is just talking about the language we will implement, which the language has a very C-like syntax, but also it's all like C, it doesn't have an entry point. So you can see it's a JavaScript-like syntax because like JavaScript, it doesn't have entry point. You can just have some code and then it's interpret from top to bottom. You can just write code like this. Print is not a function though, it's a primitive because probably when we implement print, we still haven't implemented function yet. Though usually when we implement those kind of stuff later, we can change them into functions. The, the language, the attributes of the language first is dynamically typed, which means uh, our objects actually have types stored in them and they are checked at runtime. With, in a static type language, then our object may or may not have type information. And some of the type checking happened at the compile time. So that's why static type language can be much faster and also they can catch error earlier. But also less flexible, I guess, I don't know. I'm really biased against the dynamic type languages. Also our language is using automatic mem uh, mem management, which can be reference counting or tracing garbage collection. I guess that's why people say reference counting is not garbage collection, but at least, at least I think reference counting is a garbage collection. And I think some other sources also agree with me about that. But that's, that's why I say it's up to debate. Different people have different opinions. For reference, for reference counting, one thing you need to handle is cycles. We like the uh, early version of Python also just can't handle cycles, for example, but then we need to mitigate that somehow. Because if we have cycles, then they just refer to each other with reference count being one. And if we don't have any other reference to them, then they will never get deleted. For tracing garbage collection, the book actually talked about a very simple implementation in chapter 26, when we implement the second part.
those are just like data types uh, similar to language we are familiar with, like booleans, numbers, strings. Now is a little bit weird because uh, people nowadays like to say nail is bad, but unfortunately for a dynamically typed language, we, we don't have much options. It's, our value can, can be anything anyway. So one of the choices, it can be nothing. Having uh, some type like uh, maybe or optional, don't even add anything if our language is dynamically typed because it can't be enforced and you just add more boilerplate. That's why this language also have new. Those kind of things, expressions, arithmetics, this should be just what we're familiar with. The book doesn't have, the book doesn't talk about the like operator, operator presidency is low, but we will certainly talk about them when we do parsing. And we also have comparisons, logical operators, not, and all. I find this design choice really weird where they use and and all as keyword, but then not is as this prefix uh, symbol, just weird inconsistency. <laughs> And particular thing to notice is and and all are short circuiting, which, which is important. I just recently I had a bug that uh, it's something or something, but then because something is uh, something uh, true, the other branch never get executed. You uh, recently have a bug like that. So it's important to remember those uh, short circuiting. And then because operators have precedence, sometimes we don't know which one is higher than other. And other time it's just the precedence is not what we want. And we need to do parentheses. Then, yeah, then we have statement which and uh, semicolons. So before we have expressions. So expressions are something that can evaluate into a value. So yes, just if we want run our interpreter on an expression, it will reduce into a single value. And val a value is just like the, those things like either Boolean or number or string or new. An expression, we can always reduce them into a value. That's called uh, evaluation. And then for, for statement is a different. Statements run some command. So a statement job is purely a side, a side effect. Unlike, uh, unlike expression job is produce a value. And some expressions also have side effects. So sometimes we can just have an expression followed by a semicolon, which is an expression statement. Even though in this particular case, uh, this is just BS because we are running expression with no side effects, then we just discard its value. And the language also have variables. An interesting design choice is that the variable can be uninitialized. 
though in this case, the value will just be nil. So not really uninitialized, it's just like, with this syntax, it will just be initialized into nil. And also if while for loop, all the familiar stuff, functions, and the fun part, I guess, all, but even almost all the dynamic type languages, major ones support that is closure, which means first the functions are first class, which we can treat them as values, we can pass them around, or we can even return them. We can have local functions, but also it's like in this fun, this fun case, where this is called closure, where the inner function will remember the outside function's value. And then when we call the inner function, it, it will print this value. So this is also a feature that almost all modern programming languages support, but in languages like C, C++ or Rust, it's not by default. The functions don't support that. You need uh, separate Lambda expressions, but for, for other languages like say Python or JavaScript, every functions before, uh, perf uh, like behave in this way. At the end, at the end, we have some also OOP features added to the language. I guess because people like to see OOPs bad, they also, also decide to include some motivation about why this language wants to be object oriented. <clears throat> Someone want to say something? Okay. Uh, yeah, and then our language is a uh, classes based language. So it is more like, Python or Ruby, not like JavaScript. Yeah, it's prototype based. And since our language is dynamically typed, we can just add random stuff into object And then the language also have inheritance, which we'll talk about it at the end of the first interpreter. Also the second interpreter, we need to implement the same things. For the standard library parts, the language doesn't have any, doesn't have much, yeah. because it doesn't add much for the value of the book, but for any like useful language, having a library to do stuff is very important. So yeah, that's the uh, whole three chapters with, uh, I guess it's additional design note about expressions and statement because some programming languages don't have statements. They are expression oriented. Every everything is an expression, like Lisp, uh, ML, uh, Haskell, Ruby, CoffeeScript. I'm not familiar with CoffeeScript, but <laughs> there are some there are some interesting trade offs 
between those. And also there are some, there are some also weird mixture of that where like Rust. Rust does have statement, but Rust have more expressions than most languages with a say syntax. For example, if is an expression in Rust. So uh, in, yes. in this locks language is uh, like, you know, variable assignment is is that a, a, a statement or or yeah. or an expression yeah. it's a statement yeah, it's a statement the logs have statement and assignment is naturally a statement it doesn't say but it is oh uh, assignment itself may not be a statement though I am not sure. We probably need to look at later, but assignment itself depends because in C, assignment is an expression. That's how you can train assignment. Like A equal to B equal to C kind of stuff. Don't do that, but you can. <laughs> <laughs> so because the like, it's so dynamic. You, you you mentioned that like you could just add random stuff to an object, and you know it's not going to complain. Um, that makes it seem more like you know like prototype, like you know because you know you can now just have slot. You could add arbitrary slots, you know, to a to an object. I I don't know if that's. That's you you can you do you can do that in Python and Ruby too. It's not okay. related to prototype. Okay, I I didn't know that. I've never I've never done that in in those those languages. Okay. Yeah, so. I guess at the end of the day, people find mm -hmm. this kind of flexibility is that really useful? It's, right, it's, it's fun. It's, it's, it's fun, li but it liberating, also, it's but makes it's the also... language slower. And it's confused everyone when you use it. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a source of bugs. No, no yeah. question about it. Yeah, yeah. I found that the most one of the more challenging things, what you know, in implementing a language like this was the um, the closures, right? Because you 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 have like you know different scopes and 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 environments and so you you mm -hmm. you sort of create like this chain of 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 environments and then when you look up a variable it's 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 like you you're trying to find if it's in if it's within the it, it, within the scope you're 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 if it's valid within the scope you're in and which which variable you're you know you're you're actually binding to and and so you you know, as you as you evaluate the the, the scope of the closure, you know, based on yeah. the environment that it's closing on, it, it, it it's uh, you know, it it, it you, you got to think about it, you know, like what when you're implementing it, it's not like, you you know, you you have to create like a a model, you know, and 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 build data structures that that allow you to do that in a in a in a in an efficient way and that 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 i found that to be you know one of the more fun fun aspects of of implementing a language like this i'm i'm glad that that they that it supports closures because you know i i i, I feel like it's very the very powerful construct that that's it's worth learning how to do it's also also like if we are doing a dynamically typed language mm -hmm. like Python, Ruby, uh, JavaScript, just the popular ones all support closures. So mm -hmm. it's a very common thing. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, it it, it is. It's and yeah. You said closure is hard. Yeah, like 
it's really easy to uh, like introduce dynamic typing. So, so dynamic scoping. So there is a, so there is a different idea of lexical scoping, which is like the what we are doing with closure, but also dynamic scoping, which is just when we see a variable, we search. Yeah, I don't, I don't I don't like I don't like dynamic scoping. It's <laughs> that, just it, it it's breaks just like my, breaks my brain. To, when we implement this kind of interpreter, it's uh, very easy to get this bug. It's not like we intentionally do that because people intentionally did that and find it's confusing, but it's still easy to get through this bug, like unintentionally. Yeah, yeah, le lexical scope is the way to go. Yeah, yeah, even modern Lisp dialects all become lexical scoped. Dynamic scoping is basically just people talking about if you design a language, be careful about that. Yeah, think twice before yeah. you <laughs> before you do. I think yeah, we can stop recording here and but I will hang out it here. But people people also if you want to leave, you can just leave. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna punch out. That thank you, Leslie. This this was fun. I'll be back for more. Yeah, so we will have another meeting in two weeks. So not have